Good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to the Wheeler Centre. My name's Sally Warhaft, and this is, um, well, our fifth estate uh, series, and tonight I'm overjoyed uh, to have somebody that we've been trying to get here for a little while, and we've succeeded at, I think, exactly the right time uh, to talk about the age of defence. Uh, it's a, an issue, I should say, that at the Fifth Estate over the past four years we have con consistently looked at at least once or twice a year. Uh, we had the Chief of the Army, David Morrison, here in 2012. Uh, we've had um, uh, numerous Robert Hill, Alan DuPont, James Brown, Greg Sheridan. Um, it's a, it's a, an abiding interest of ours here. But uh, Catherine McGregor's entire military career has been just simply distinguished. Uh, she went to Duntroon in 1974. Uh, she uh, did an honours degree in arts for which she was awarded the CEW Bean Prize in military history. She's held numerous appointments over, in fact, I think four decades uh, with the Australian Army, including speechwriter to uh, Chief of Army David Morrison and Catherine, of course, wrote the brilliant speech uh, that, uh, uh, well, we transformed really speech making. I wrote in my book, first YouTube speech uh, in Australia to ever be hugely significant, where he looked down the barrel of that camera and said, if you don't like it, then get out and uh, those words were penned by our guest. Catherine's currently the Director of Research and Analysis in the Office of the Chief of Air Force. In 2012, she was awarded the Order of Australia in the Military Division for her exceptional contribution to Army strategic policy. In her spare time, she writes about cricket and uh, is in fact also a gifted commentator. Please give her a very, very warm welcome. <laughs> Catherine, uh, we had a little chat about this the other day and I was taken by, uh, well, everything you said, in fact, but you, you said that when we talk about defence, what we're really talking about is war and its manifestations, that the potentially violent contest of ideas seems to be hardwired in our species and to discuss defence is to discuss how we deal with this undesirable part of being a, a human being. I thought we could start by you talking a bit about that, about how you think of that. Well, I, yeah, Sally, I, I think uh, the original promotion for the topic was it was the age of war rather than the age of defence. And I've dedicated a large part of my professional life to the study of war and, you know, deployed on operations on numerous occasions and the professional mastery of violence is what military forces are about. And there's a tradition amongst Western militaries indeed of, of, of attempting to intellectually grapple with the nature of the phenomenon. And that started most notably, well, you, went, you can trace it back to Thucydides basically, but probably the great thinker about warfare and he grew out of that age of romanticism and post-enlightenment thinking that also gave us Marx and others and it was Clausewitz who Clausewitz conceptualized war a, a, as a true chameleon that absorbed the prevailing social and political context in which it was waged and he talked of war as the true chameleon and likened war to a duel where one tries to impose one's will on an opponent for political objectives. And he was the person who, as, as blindingly obvious as it seems to us today, it was this profound insight when he said war is the, ultimate, is the ultimate political act, or in fact, in the terms of the German translation, war is policy by violent means. So in the world that we're inhabiting now, um, I've been looking at you know, what, what is going on with warfare? What is it doing? And I'm bleak about the fact that I do think, as a species, uh, and this is not to downplay that every effort we make to strive for peace, 
or to look at collective security as a preventative for war. But I've come to a very bleak conclusion if you look at the anthropological history and the best person in this field, for those of you who are scholars or interested in the topic, there's an absolutely uh, must-read book by Azar Gat just called War as a Human Phenomenon. He's a, an, an Israeli uh, historian and strategic studies scholar and he's looked back and basically argued that there is evidence amongst pre agricultural societies of the waging of war. It's as old as, as human beings. And so I, I proceed on the assumption that there isn't a golden age of peace around the corner and that in the bleak words of the philosopher Plato, if you, if you wish for peace, then prepare for war. And so I've made a professional study of war and I guess war the true chameleon, I look at now in 2015 and say, we're engaged in a, we're engaged in a war in the Middle East that is a product of the failure of the state system. You are looking at the Sykes-Picot arrangements that occurred in the fall of the Ottoman Empire in the wake of the fall of the Ottoman Empire. The state system there is disintegrating and confessional religious affiliation is definitive of those events. And yet, paradoxically, and this is where a lot of thinkers are getting into trouble. People are looking for universal formulations and a lot of good thinkers get value out of one big book. Fukuyama told us we'd seen the end of history. Mary Caldor said we were going to have new wars where state-on-state -state conflict ended and you had tribal and warlord, warlordism as was evidenced in Africa in the 90s or the Balkans. You then had Krevel, Martin van Krevel saying Clausewitz was irrelevant. All of these ideas have been ephemeral. Then you had the age of counterinsurgency embodied in, in David Kilcullen's work. Yet, if you look at war, it really is uh, diffuse. You've got state failure in the Middle East and hybrid war by a potent non-state actor. And yet, in our region, the most grave threat is a traditional state-on-state -state conflict between nuclear arms states either in the South China Seas or in Northeast Asia, where you've got increasing friction with an assertive China and an assertive Japan that's renewing its kind of uh, ability to project force. I've probably talked too long, but that's the context in which military professionals are, are trying to look at the globe and saying, what is the global system doing? What is the cohering idea around which we now configure our military forces to meet Everything on that spectrum of contingencies, be it projecting air power, say, against a non-state actor in the Middle East, or being prepared um, to put an opponent at risk at very long range, at short notice, against a state actor, uh, to guarantee the security of our sea lines of communication, and we are reliant as a trading nation on some of the most vulnerable choke points in the world, in the Straits of Malacca and South China Seas, which are highly contested areas now. So these, that is the kind of zeitgeist against which you know, Clausewitz looking at Australian defence policy now would say that we're in a, in a geopolitical context that mandates certain approaches. What about what you've just described about the state of play, this bleak state of play in the world? It, it feels very bleak to me, but then again, I wasn't alive for World War II. Mm. So, you know, how unique is this situation? Well, it's in, that's a great question and, it, you know, it is. I think it's a human foible that we flatter ourselves by thinking that we're confronting uniquely dire times. I wouldn't imagine, and I, I study air power now, I studied land power intensively for the better part of 40 years. I now I'm look, looking at air power and its application and looking at the bombing of cities, which the modern practitioners of air warfare in civilised countries would find it unthinkable that we would launch thousand bomber raids on cities like Hamburg or deliver a nuclear device against a, a civilian target in Hiroshima. We did That, that happened in, in the lifetimes of our parents. So... <sighs> This Hobbesian kind of world that, that I'm describing, it is easy to be bleak and it is easy to think we're living 
you know, and so our, our opponents in the Middle East think we are living in the end time, driving the political and combat motivation of ISIL is a sense that near Dabikar in Syria, the end time, the Armageddon battle is coming between what they see as the forces of Islam and the forces of Rome, which is their broad classification of the infidels. They think they're living in prophetic times. It's easy to do that, but if you, this will sound counterintuitive, but Azar Gat, whose work I've invoked, actually thinks we're almost living amid a golden age of peace. Now, you're going to all burst out laughing when I say that, but he actually has done the hard yards on crunching the numbers. And state-on-state -state conflict, the most destructive and the most violent form of warfare has been in steady decline since Waterloo, um, the 200th anniversary of which fell just last week. And you can look at the trajectory. The bad news is that when we have a major state-on-state -state conflict, it tends to be incredibly intense and that the tempo of operations and the rate of casualties per unit of time elapsed is just awful. So hence the two world wars, those attritional conflicts in World War I and the, ex and the, the almost unrestricted war against civilians in World War II. Horrific casualties. But in fact, state-on-state -state warfare is in decline. Having said that, and, and I'm aware that I'm talking too long on these answers, uh, so tell me to shut up. But I not not even close, Catherine. Yeah. But the the problem with and a lot of again a lot of good thinkers, many of whom with whom I've studied or, or debated these topics, thought in the wake of the Cold War that we would see the Balkanisation of Europe, that you would see wars like we saw in Kosovo that the state-on-state -state paradigm was irrelevant, yet you've got a newly assertive Russia uh, pushing up against NATO, and we're now looking and starting to see that there's a pushback to almost Cold War levels of tension in Eastern Europe. Uh, I spoke to RAF pilots last year who were on five, you know, on, there were RAF pilots at, at RAF Conningham with their engines idling to intercept Soviet bombers who were probing British airspace last July, the same way as they did at the height of the Cold War. The Swedes had incursions while I was at a conference with, with the Swedish Air Force last year. They, uh, so you've got these kind of state-on-state -state frictions. And what Azar Gat says is that those people who think, while it is in decline, the huge risk that he sees going forward, and let's leave terrorism in the context that it, that it warrants and state non-state actors in the... In the, as alarming as they are, they're not, as Dennis Richardson reminded us, an existential threat to Australia or the, or the normative system which we rely on globally. But we are living in an era now where for the first time since the 1930s we have two significant totalitarian capitalist powers. The last time we had totalitarian capitalist powers, namely Imperial Japan and Nazi Germany, we had a global conflagration. And his worry is that while state-on-state -state warfare has become very risky, the inferences that Fukuyama and others drew from that are wrong because it isn't impossible to contemplate war between capitalist countries. Liberal democratic capitalist countries tend to apply force to one another less, but the game that we're seeing now is, if it has any precedent, is in, in the great power sense, is, is reminiscent of about 1936. And in the non-state Middle Eastern area is actually somewhat similar to the pre-Westphalian system of Europe in the, in the 1630s and 40s. Mm -hmm. So you have this situation, you've got powerful state actors, you've got quasi-state actors, non-state actors, and as you say, each nation state has to come up with a coherent strategy to somehow defend itself um, against all of this and so much more. I mean, there's cybercrime, there, there's so uh, immigration control, all those uh, countless other issues. How does a country, though, like Australia where do you even begin in sorting through that? Mm. And, and where does our focus lie? 
Well, again, you... I think you start in a number of areas that you know, the, people mystify strategy and grand strategy, but ultimately it is about the application of the available means to the strategic ends. And quite often, and I've been guilty of it myself, I've been in really elaborate PowerPoint presentations and whiteboards full of squiggly things with fantastic acronyms and jargon on them until someone sort of punctured it and said, what are we trying to achieve again? And it's kind of a useful place to start sometimes rather than ventilating how much you know about war or strategy before you actually know where you're going. But So first principles are generally a country and Australia being very much... Australia has a strategic culture and a strategic history. Whatever we do has to be viewed in the context of where we've come from. We're the product of a lot of our decisions, we're the product of our geography, we're the product of the institutions of governance that have, have grown up in this country. If there's one overarching narrative about how Australia secures itself in the world, it would be to say that we have allied ourselves with the dominant liberal democratic maritime power of the, of the era. And we've been spoilt strategically in that throughout our, the period of white settlement and certainly through our period of formal nationhood, the dominant maritime power has either been Great Britain with the prodigious reach of the Royal Navy or the United States with its enormous naval and military resources that provide a free public good to Australia. And I'm assuming... Uh, the complexion of this audience. I, I, I know I'm not at the Centre for Independent Studies um, this evening, so <laughs> I'm assuming there's not a huge consensus in favour of the United States military in the room. But there is a free public good that Australia gets, which is access to the global commons in an unimpaired manner, and our trade flows uh, surreptitiously and without incident because of the norms that are enforced around the globe and the, the unimpaired freedom of navigation, which occurs globally as a, as a complete free good to Australia. And I would now say that in the era we're occupying that the global commons are no longer the traditional domains that when I joined the army in 1974, we talked about land war, uh, air warfare and, and, and war on the sea. And at the intersection of those domains, you tried to generate joint effects to orchestrate the, the elements of each force that had a distinctive capability. And what it basically was about, that's a grand way of saying that the weaknesses in one element of your force could be offset by the others. So you used airstrikes against targets that were too difficult for land forces and you could use sea-based platforms to exercise an effect on land in support of your land forces if you're doing a, a contested sea invasion or, or that order. Those domains are now joined up through cyberspace and they're joined up through outer space. So you've got five domains. You've got cyber, space, land, sea and air and the intersection of all of them. And really, Australia now is... So what where Australia will start at is how do we continue to enjoy freedom of action in our immediate region? How do we guarantee our territorial integrity? And how do we, as a, as a citizen of the Western Alliance, continue to enjoy unimpaired access to the global commons? And where it gets really tough is in the area that we're entering now, which is there is competition in those other areas like cyber and space that is going on as a kind of an arm wrestle even as we speak. And technically we can take space off the table tomorrow. You know, the Chinese have ostentatiously used a killer satellite. Uh, that's dumb. Um, in the end, the maximal effect in space is to use your opponent's access to space without their knowing you're using it and don't take the whole system down because we can't afford to take cyber and space off the table or we will cripple the global economy. So 
the ability to operate and contest those areas going into the future is going to be it's going to require people who are vastly brighter than I am, I can tell you. I, I, I know what the problem looks like and I know what the theoretical bounds of the problem are, but it's not my area. You know, we're about to probably recruit a whole bunch of people. When I joined the military, you know, there was this idealised recruiting poster, soldier. I used to look like it once, but I've changed a bit since then. Um, Alistair Cook kind of looks like it, Sal, as a cricket fan. Nice. You know. Yeah. Uh, the person who may excel in the new domains is probably living like a vampire in their mum's basement, you know, um, eating pizza and intermittently surfing pornographic sites or something. They may be the hero of the next cyber war. And we, you know, that's one of the challenges facing us is how, where do we find people who are outstanding in that narrow band of expertise? I, I'm, I, I'm, I am sitting here just focused on that at the moment, that if we need that many people seriously smarter than you, uh, we're in deep trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but let's just put that aside for the moment, um, just to unpick a little of what you've just said. So Australia's always had its allies with the great maritime powers. It's still a maritime game, isn't it? Yes. Defence, is it? And, and, and in Australia as well? When we hear politicians out there talking about submarines... It always seems to be about submarines, mm -hmm. and I always think, why are we so obsessed about submarines? And then I read David Morrison's speeches, in fact, which you probably wrote, uh, and he, it, he, he's, he's, he seems to have a, a love affair with the Navy. It's so much about the water. So can you explain a bit of that to us? Sure. Um, the, look... The maritime element of Australian security is incredibly important. Um, the previous chief of the Navy said a thing I'd have killed to have found. I, I plagiarised it with attribution, but it was a great line. He said we should change the first line of Advanced Australia Fair to um, girt by beach rather than girt by <laughs> sea. Because as a country, we don't think in a maritime sense. We have an incredibly continentalist mindset, notwithstanding the fact we've got this enormous coastline, the largest exclusive economic zone on the planet. And yet there's a kind of, and it's really interesting if you talk about the soul of Australia and you talk about the dreaming and the imagining, even the white fella dreaming, it's about Ayers Rock, it's about Uluru, it's about the harshness, the bush myth. We don't think of ourselves as a seafaring people and yet enormous volumes of trade, tra you know, in infinitesimal amounts of commerce are conducted by air. Obviously, financial transactions are immensely reliant on the cyberspace networking, but our livelihood comes and goes through sea lines of communication, so the sea is vitally important. There was a great thinker about maritime warfare, the, the kind of the father of maritime thought was a, was a British lawyer called Julian Corbett who was hired by the Admiralty when Jackie Fisher and Churchill were at their peak. He, like Clausewitz, had the, the great idea. His idea about sea warfare was that it was ultimately about achieving effect on the land and that's where the armies have started to come into this, that there has been a sense that maritime is about sea platforms, submarines particularly. Uh, it's also about overflight, and we've got a formidable maritime strike and surveillance capability inside our Air Force, which operates seamlessly with our Navy. But when you look at the approaches to Australia, and if you look at the worst case scenario, and it's only happened once in our history where there was any direct existential threat by a nation state, it came towards us through the archipelagic approaches to Australia. A lot of people who think a bit lazily think that we have a thing called an air-sea gap around Australia, but it's actually an air-sea land gap. There are 13,000 islands in the Indonesian archipelago. To project air power beyond into the South China Sea requires soft power diplomacy, negotiation for forward basing. One of the platforms we're bringing into service on the 30th of June has expanded our range of options, both in humanitarian assistance into 
a very climate change affected area of the globe and, a, and an area that's very prone to all kinds of natural disasters. We're getting a platform in that has expanded the reach into regional airfields from 500 to over 2,000. So we think of that entire space now as not a gap but as a series of island hopping points that essentially we need to, in conjunction with our neighbours, be able to project force into. And hence David's interest in, one, the Navy with these large ships that have been brought specifically to em embark troops and move them into the archipelagic approaches to Australia. But secondly, we've got to get more adaptive and agile about our ability to project anywhere in the neighbourhood because the low budget approach that's now being adopted by any number of places is to say, well, it, it's cheaper to do what's called A2AD, anti-access area denial operations, where ballistic missiles that used to have a kind of a common aim point error of kilometres now can land within metres. And the Chinese have developed this to a very fine art and, and the US are looking at it very closely because the 1996 Taiwan crisis, for example, they steamed two carrier groups into the uh, area around Taiwan and China was forced to back down and they basically resolved that would never happen again and they've devoted a large amount of their doctrinal and expenditure uh, effort onto how can you shower a US carrier flip group with ballistic missiles skimming at sea level and it's a, it's a really wicked problem if you're on, a, on an aircraft carrier. So they're trying to make that area completely inaccessible to the United States. And so the whole picture now is very much linked into projecting power at sea, but in order to exercise an effect on land. And that idea traces back to Corbett, who basically said maritime means using sea power to achieve an effect on land, because nobody lives on the ocean. They live on the land. The army is a projectile oh, well remembered. used by... The Navy. Fired by, yeah. Lord no, Grey. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, well remembered. There's not much left in my memory at the <laughs> moment, but <laughs> there we are. Now, you've talked um, in the last two or three minutes, you mentioned Taiwan, you mentioned the US, you mentioned Australia, you mentioned direct threats, but it's, it's indirect threats, I imagine, are our greatest threat here. So if China wants to go into Taiwan and they get into a tango with America and that free ride you talked about earlier, which I don't think it is completely free because we've got these nasty little unknown going, well, they, they may or may not, probably not nasty, but we don't know is the point mm -hmm. what American military is doing in Australia right now. It was something Malcolm Fraser was very concerned about. He was a guest here uh, and he, he worried about that more than anything else, the US uh, bases that he argued made us vulnerable to a Chinese uh, wanting to take out those military, uh, whatever they are, uh, in order to do whatever they want to do in the main game with Taiwan. Is that a real threat? Yeah, it's real, I, but I, I, I'd frame it differently to Malcolm Fraser. I, I imagine you would. I, yeah. And I don't, don't want to be disrespectful, mm. but I, I, we do know what is going on because they're actually not US facilities, they're joint facilities, and that's not just tokenism. It was a, it was a, 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 a long, hard battle fought. Uh, it's a going, US commandment, though, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> Well, there, we have pretty... There, there, look, there may be a room or something at some of the facilities that are US eyes only, but we've got extraordinary sharing of intelligence and access. And we are definitely linked into a network that carries obligations, there's no doubt, and it carries benefits too. And when I talk about free public goods, the amount of access to space and cyber and the, the intelligence of global significance, and we're in a globalised world now where threats can emanate a long way from our immediate region, the amount of 
access that we get through those facilities and relationships out of that. With and they're not only it's not only us; it's the Canadians and the Brits and New Zealanders to some extent as well. I'm not ducking your question, but I I think the idea that there's some kind of US facility on Australian soil that's doing dire things that we have no control over is a little overwrought, frankly. Uh, we're very linked into them. And there are certain reasons. There are reasons for the nature of the surface of the globe and its relationship to space-based platforms that make Australia incredibly important. One, we're now a long way out of the range, of, and China has been trying to increase the range of its ballistic missiles to the, they can now engage out to the first island chain with some precision, and they're talking about trying to push further into the Western Pacific, so the United States is looking for secure basing, hence the arrangements for transiting through Darwin and so on. There are stations that operate as part of a global network, and the benefit of Australia is that it has a massive expanse of geography that allows spatial separation of certain parts of that network so that you've got redundancy and that prevailing cloud cover would have to be of a, of a scope beyond Tim Flannery's wildest imaginings, basically, to put, to put the network at risk in one hit so it's open all the time. And the Americans are incredibly reliant on that. Now. Where I disagree with Malcolm Fraser is, I, I, I don't run around with my hair on fire over that proposition. Um, I would have a bigger problem with the fact that it's regarded as legitimate for China to preemptively strike those as a preliminary operation for reclaiming Taiwan, which is currently functioning as a, you know, as a functioning democracy that has been there for a long time. And you know, what, what do you say about what, what kind of equilibrium in the global system says that we're all supposed to look on and watch that happen and not have a, a view on it. And the other thing is, if you read any of um, the PLA's warfighting doctrine, and doctrine is only a way of conceptualising strategic problems, it's not policy. But it's pretty alarming when you read some of the thinking that comes out of PLA think tanks, where, as a precursor to any operation against Taiwan, uh, it is regarded as absolutely uh, just core business that you strike American carrier groups based at Hokkaido in Japan. Now, Japan's a non-combatant and also a significant trading partner of Australia and another friendly, well-disposed democracy. Um, and so if, to Hugh White and Bob Carr and Malcolm Fraser and others, I'd be saying, well, at what, at what level are we the problem in this course of behaviour? If, if you're seriously suggesting that we're at risk, well, what are the steps that constitute the risk? And it would be some form of preemptive strike against those facilities as a precursor to an operation against two other nations, one of which we've got extremely deep links to. And I, I think at some point you're either in the game of being a reliable partner in the Western Alliance or you're not. Uh, and removal of those from our soil, OK, might negate the problem, but it would also open the door to a shift in the normative distribution of power upon which our prosperity has, has relied for a very long time. And I have to say, I don't want to be churlish about it, because he's deceased now, but I had the great pleasure of interviewing Gough Whitlam in 2007. And Gough always reminded, I've still got this 16th of June 2007, I spent a long time talking to him about defence and security policy, and Goff remembered going on a study tour to the Pentagon where Fraser was really finger in the chest of the Americans about using nuclear weapons in South Vietnam. Um, so his reinvention as a kind of a, a pacifist who didn't agree with the use of military force in the US alliance was never entirely persuasive to me, I have to say, and I, I just disagree vehemently with that proposition, and I've, I've banged on too long about it. Um, it's interesting that whenever we have a discussion about defence, whoever it is with, we don't end up talking about the things that dominate the media. And so at the moment, of course, we would naturally assume that the threat of Australians coming back from Syria would 
be the greatest threat to Australian security right now. Um, I'm not saying, obviously, that it's not a threat. It clearly is. But it's not what we're talking about. We're talking about China. We're talking about Taiwan. We're talking about our alliances with major powers um, and so on. Where does the terrorist threat sit in, in terms of where we're at risk, where our focus should lie, and our priorities? Look, I, it's a, I may have presented it in too binary a term, uh, Sally, and I hope I haven't, but I think Dennis Richardson gave, the, the Secretary of the Department gave a blame oration a couple of weeks ago, which I thought was, was excellent in the way he looked at the hierarchy of the problems. It is not for one moment to derogate the, the one, the, the nature of Islamic State uh, in Iraq and the Levant or Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, whichever nomenclature you prefer. They're serious problems and we, we have a role in providing assistance to Iraq. And again, regardless of which side of the debate about the invasion of Iraq you were on, there is a heightened obligation on Australia now, having, having participated in the breaking up of, of a unitary state there, to in some way deal with the fallout of that. And there, I don't believe it's in the interests of Australia, the United States, or, and indeed a large number of NATO countries to see a complete breakdown of the Middle East and genocides against ethnic and religious minorities there and a, and a complete, you know, essentially a, a disintegration of, of, of Syria and Iraq and its replacement by this caliphate. When they made the spectacular advances they made about this time last year, I didn't take their claim to statehood seriously. I'm much more, they're much more on the radar now. The US is starting to take them vastly more seriously and David Kilcullen's recent quarterly essay and some of the stuff he's written, again, he's a very good thinker and I think he's made the point that getting into name calling and you know, insisting on using Daesh rather than ISIL and all these things is, is kind of not where the main game's at. It's, it's aping state behaviour it is controlling large tracts of territory. It's providing some level of governance. It's imposing taxes. It's now moved beyond a terrorist organisation. It's not quite non... It's, it's, this, it's, it's shifting it, to a sort of yeah, it, something... It, yeah, you're quite quasi. right. And it, it's probably more like a state than it's not. So I, th it, I don't think we can sit idly by and allow the declaration of a caliphate because, again, if you... I take... ISIL seriously and I take international jihadism seriously and I take it seriously militarily and I take their religious claims seriously as well. I don't just blow that aside. Their prophetic vision is real to them. I disagree with it vehemently uh, but the fact is they, these people are highly motivated. They genuinely believe that it is a prerequisite to the establishment of the caliphate that they control certain areas in Syria and Iraq. Mosul's a very significant place. Raqqa, the capital that they've got now, is, is of significance. And this is the nature of this organisation. It, it, if, if you, I don't know how many people have studied this much, but there's a terrific book by Jessica Stern that's worth a look on ISIL. Uh, Kilcullen's work on this is really worth a look. But the bo again, I'm not trying to give George Bush a walk on the first, uh, second Iraq war, but the idea that ISIL is a product of the invasion of Iraq is, a, is absolute nonsense. ISIL grew out of the al Zakawi network. Uh, Zakawi was a Jordanian who fell out with an AQ, Al-Qaeda, had a fractious relationship with bin Laden, and it was a doctrinal dispute about glo global strategy. And I do have a point here, because why, why I think it is important that we defeat them or at least degrade them is that we need to remove their capacity and credibility to engage in globally, in global projection of force. Can, can you defeat this? That's a, that's a moot point. I, there's, we can do a lot more militarily than we're doing. I think we can, we, we can defeat them in a sense that you can contain them so they're not a dire existential threat to 
what's on their shopping list, probably Jordan and Egypt next. But I'll just round that point out about how it's emerged. Al Zakawi said that we've got to exterminate the Shia. They're the serpent in our backyard. What Al Qaeda, the, the, the game breaking thought that, uh, that bin Laden had after the first Gulf War, when he fell out with the Saudi royal family, to whom he had been close, he found it an abomination that the Sauds invited the United States military into the land of the holy places to repel Saddam Hussein. He wanted to declare a jihad against Saddam when he invaded Kuwait. That's when he ruptured with the Saudi royal family and went to Afghanistan. We went to Sudan first, then Afghanistan. And he said, the only way to bring down these um, irreligious or sacrilegious regimes is to destroy the United States first. The centre of gravity of the House of Saud is the US. They used to talk about the near Satan and the far Satan, Israel and the United States. His and al-Zawahiri's great strategic vision was we're wasting our time destabilising Mubarak and, and the, you know, the, the regime in Yemen and so on. We need to take out their funding and their ideological support in the United States, hence 9-11. Al-Zakawi fell out with them in the 2000s during the war in Iraq and said, we've got to eliminate the Shia and we've got to develop the caliphate according to the, the prophetic vision of the prophet, which means... We, the Shia are the near enemy, so we exterminate them. And that's what has given this... The, this is what has given this whole crisis such a, a ghastly aura in that you're dealing with 7th century behaviour in you know, the whole beheadings and the stonings and the nature of the conflict. And th th they have a calculus, and it is to set up a caliphate that stretches... And you can see the map if you go on to CNN, you can see what their aspiration is to set this thing up. It's complicated by the complete ambiguity of US policy, which fleetingly, in the wake of the Arab Spring, told Assad to go, then said there's a, you know, a red line you can't cross, and he crossed it, he used chemical weapons against his own people. In Syria, there was a fleeting opportunity where you actually had a moderate Arab you know, a, if you're talking in revolutionary terms, a Kerenskyite minority that might have just about been able to, to take the Arab Spring to Syria. They took Obama seriously, stuck their heads up and were promptly exterminated. Mm. They're either in exile or dead. So the only credible anti-Assad force is the Sunni militia that became ISIL, migrated out of Iraq, out of the Zakawi network. So what is a coherent Australian policy on this? Well, you know, we're, obviously the focus at the moment is on citizenship. Uh, where is, is that part, do you think, of a coherent policy? Uh, and, and where should that focus be? I've, I've got to be really careful on yeah, this in that I, I'm, I'm a serving, yeah. Yeah, for a good reason, I don't want to bottle out of this, but I'm a serving military officer and that's a domestic issue as is the nature of most counter-terrorism operations. And there's a good reason why uh, MacArthur's great speech at West Point where he talks about the profession of arms and he talks about the obligation of the military professional in a democratic state. And those questions of citizenship and whether Chapter 3, whether a law offends Chapter 3 of the Constitution are not matters upon which I can publicly voice an opinion. In terms of a coherent strategy for us, we're a medium power. We have global reach through air power, so we can project force there in a coalition setting. We're not a decisive player in this. We're, we're providing a meaningful contribution to a global effort against this threat. But l there's a fantastic piece by Anthony Cordesman came out of the CSIS in Washington over the weekend about the incoherence in US strategy. We're not using air power nearly violently enough. It's the number of sorties we're flying is is minimal. It's not shock and awe. We're tending to do. Uh, is Australia's incoherent too, though, in yeah. the sense that since uh, say East Timor, yeah, we've just overreached. We're everywhere. 
I don't think it's overreach, but the fact is we are a minor player. We have, we have quite limited military force. So we participate in coalitions. And again, I know there's a, probably a consensus in the audience that we sign up for everything the US does. Um, there's a reason for that. That is, we don't, we don't enjoy freedom of action except in a place like Timor where we were able to lead a coalition. It was on our doorstep and the threat w environment was manageable. On operations like the one we're engaged in in the Middle East, we can only contribute niche capabilities, mm. essentially. Mm. And if, you're only, if you've only got that much skin in the game, then you don't own the strategy. So, you know, I could tell you what I'd like to do to ISIL tomorrow, but it doesn't matter a hill of beans, frankly. W w would you tell us? Or you better well, I think we it. could escalate the number of sorties mm. pretty dramatically. Um, and I, um, again, it's not, it's not overly, uh, you know, I think we're... Do people know much about air power or how this stuff happens? We, we, oh, some will, some we, won't. No, we, it, we, okay, well, it's not a military audience. The way it works is that the, 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 we're attacking ground targets using a mixture of what's called dynamic targeting, and they're from aircraft that are flying in a thing called a CAS stack. They're flying a racetrack pattern over the theatre of operations, and they're on call, and you can cue them as a target comes up. Due to the nature of the rules of engagement, we clear our targets through a number of layers of, to comply with very strict rules of engagement on collateral damage. And there is a time delay in our dynamic targeting that means that fleeting opportunities for road convoys and other things can be missed. And it's because we're erring on the side of not killing civilians or degrading um, antiquities or doing other things. So the type of dynamic targeting that we excel at, which is where the pilot and weapons officer make the call and have a more relaxed rule of engagement. We're not doing that. We're also not as empowered by the fact that the Iraqi land forces have been severely degraded and a lot of people mock them. There's a lot of populist stuff written in the press. But some of these guys have been at war for 10 years. They're, they're broken, you know, and I, I, you've got to have some sympathy. Everyone's got a finite amount of combat in them. And so they're, they're not as robust as they might be. So the joint tactical air controllers, the people who paint targets with precision and cue in the, the grid reference or laser the target for the guided bomb to go onto, that capacity is lacking. And as part of the building partner capacity effort that both the US and our land forces are now engaged in, I think we will enhance the effects that we're exercising from a finite number of air sorties. But I think we could be hitting them a lot harder from the air, and I think we should be using our air power vastly more strategically. The mix between deliberate targeting of centres of gravity and dynamic targeting of fleeting opportunity targets is, is, is in my view, erring on the side of caution. And I don't want to sound like Curtis LeMay, but I just think we could be escalating a lot harder on that. I also think that... Um, the, the, and the Americans are getting close to this, there probably has to be a tough decision made that the American advisers do have to accompany the Iraqi units forward. They can't train them in safe bases and send them out. They have to absorb the risk of being in combat with them as they were in Afghanistan and as they were in, in Vietnam to, to provide, a, just to provide a coherence and a stiffening effect because they're, they're they're not in great shape, the Iraqi land forces, and they, it's got to be their fight. Um, I, I, I wouldn't recommend a huge Western footprint in Iraq. There's arguments. Jim Mullins, a friend of mine, he's arguing we need to go back in and do the Anbar awakening again and so on. I think that's wrong because of the prophetic nature of the ISIL vision. They want the encounter battle with the West in Syria as part of their prophetic vision. If you want to enhance recruitment of foreign fighters joining for Armageddon for religious reasons, park a Western army there now. And I think that would be absolutely playing into their hands. But we've got the most sophisticated air power we've ever had, and we're using it like a dripping tap instead of uh, really unleashing it. And I think we, we, we could do vastly more damage if we were into it in a, in a heavier-handed fashion. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, I enjoyed that talk. I'm not used to hearing all this stuff. I'm probably that sort of audience you're expecting tonight. 
And it's easy, I think, perhaps to talk about the future threats, yeah. but I cannot think of hardly any examples of where this defence sort of fighting strategy has actually worked in my lifetime, really. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just uh, it does my mind in that we're debating where to build these submarines and we're talking $40 billion and it's only about where, not whether. And uh, I don't know how much rethinking goes on about whether this idea that we kill each other to settle our disputes is the best way. Mm. I, look, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not at all unsympathetic. Oh, into the mic. Sorry, I'm, yes. I'm not unsympathetic to that view. And, you know, I'm, I'm 60 at my next birthday and I've spent the better part of my life doing this. And I look back on a working life, I wonder whether the world's a jot better for the whole accumulated life, frankly. And I guess it's the thing about, it's like the counter-terrorism part of the piece. We don't know what it would look like if we hadn't done it. Um, you look at those nuclear arsenals and, you know, without dating you too much, we're, we're of an age, I suspect, where we probably were kids who grew up wondering whether we might all die in a nuclear inferno. I was terrified as a kid. I, I'm old enough to remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. Were all those strategic air command B-52s a prodigious waste of money or did they prevent a war? I don't know. Uh, I wish I didn't have to subscribe to the Hobbesian view that I have, but if you look around the world now and if you look at recorded history, um, it's hard to, to imagine, this, and especially in a nation in the region we're in, with the obligations we've got, unilaterally disarming or, or not, ha not maintaining a defence force. And don't get me wrong, $40 billion would do a lot in health and education. I so, I so understand that, and so do my colleagues. And it, it, it's, I, I just, you know, I guess it's, it, we have to take the world as it is, not as we aspire for it to be, and I, it's, I hope that's probably not a very comforting answer, but be assured, no one in my business relishes this. You know, the, every operation we go on, we see dire things, and there's all kinds of things involved in it, including just the fear, the, the mere separation from your family for long periods of time, and wondering whether you've done any good. And the only time I ever came back feeling I'd unconditionally made the world a better place is when I led the training team in East Timor and I had a sort of civilian engagement program there and, and saw lives changing. I've spoken to a lot of our people who've been in Afghanistan and, and seen tangible good things happen, but it, it's kind of looking for goodness in the granularity of, a, of, a, of one school here you know, or there that mightn't be open in three years' time. And Yeah, I, I, I feel your pain and I don't say that to be facetious at all. I was wondering if you're factoring in things like climate change and um, global overpopulation and food shortages and how you counteract those sort of things. I'm sorry, I can't see you as a gentleman now. Yeah. Yeah. All right, again, I, I, need, I need to be careful because this has become somewhat contentious in the last 24 hours with the release of that paper from the Centre for Policy. Um, which, and look, I had a quick scan of the summary, and it, it's unexceptionable, frankly. There isn't, um, I, I can't preempt the white paper, and I'm not, again, not being uh, cute and a Pentagon spokesman in dodging it. I don't know what's in it, to be honest, because I'm not directly engaged. We are factoring in, it, it's assumed that in the area that we're required to operate, there is probably going to be rising sea level <clears throat> and, and more extreme climatic events. And we've, we've seen that happen quite recently. And if it, offsetting the previous gentleman's question, if it's any comfort to you, a lot of the platforms that do cost all that money and the highly trained personnel who operate them are the first responders in those kinds of disasters. As an indication, when the Vanuatu um, Category 5 cyclone hit, within 24 hours, one of our Orion surveillance maritime strike aircraft had 
had surveilled Vanuatu so that follow-on sorties could be flown. We had two C-130s, Hercules, two C-17s in there within about three days with medical teams. We moved 800,000 pounds of aid in 10 days. At last count, we'd moved over 2 million pounds of aid into Vanuatu. Philippines assist from the earthquake is, is, an, is still an active operation. We've been flying sorties in and out of there with teams ever since that. We were the first people on the ground almost in Nepal and also uh, after the earthquake in Japan. So we have factored in that we need agility, range, precision and strategic reach, not just to fight wars but to reach out and deliver humanitarian aid in our region and we've got an enormous capability to do that and we, we do it quite well and if you look at open source material on the amount of humanitarian assistance in our region even in the last two years you know we led the coalition looking for the missing Malaysian Airlines flight for instance and uh, had key, a key role in the Air Asia disappearance as well of providing surveillance and recovery assets there so that's kind of uh, the, the kinder face of what we do. And, and we do accept the reality that those kind of events are going to probably happen with increasing severity and frequency. Um, given your expertise with, um, I suppose, soft policy and the understanding you have of um, the disagreements between the main players in the Middle East with Sunni and Shia, what would be your advice to our government in terms of uh, counteracting the level of disaffection or disengagement of Muslims here in Australia that are quite cynical about, I guess, Western principles of democracy and Australia being part of that broader-based coalition? Mm. Look, I, 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 again, I, I don't want to be evasive, but it's that's not particularly in my remit, and I. I, there was a, uh, quite a bit in one of the papers today about the de-radicalisation programs and the limitations. I spoke to someone uh, who's an expert on Islam and Middle Eastern politics who made a point to me, and it was, it was obvious when he said it, and that is that he thinks all government, Australian governments have erred on the side of identifying spokespeople who just aren't credible with the, the most at-risk youth in that the, the magic of this message of, you know, and the, uh, the agility with which ISIL and ISIS have been using social media, it, it's very hard for any bureaucratised government to keep up with it, to be honest. They're very, very good at it. And it's got the mystique, you know, if you're rebellious and alienated, you're not going to listen to, you know, a kind of one of those government ads that's you know, comes out of the same agency that tells you how to, you know, get your Medicare card. It's just not, we're not competitive in that space. And <clears throat> I think it's, we're misunderstanding the nature of the religion as well, in that it doesn't have a hierarchy. It's not like you don't have cardinals. It's a, it's a congregational religion. So I think probably we lack the nous and the situational awareness to identify even the right partners in that effort. And I, I, I have no easy answers on that. I couldn't advise them because I don't know. If, if someone asked me who's the right person to talk to, but when I see earnest middle-aged and older men in suits talking on late line as spokespeople for the Islamic community and then see you know, guys in baseball caps and baggy pants taking on the police, I think they're probably not going to listen to them. It's a bit like, a bit like my dad saying, don't drive too fast, you know. <laughs> You said at the beginning that war is policy by violent means. I was just wondering how much the military forces contribute these days to policy because you mentioned that Assad had crossed the red line when he used chemical weapons, but there's a big dispute about that. For example, MIT professor uh, Ted uh, Postel and Richard Lloyd, a UN inspector, weapons inspector, dispute that and say that it was the insurgents that most likely used chemical we weapons on the 21st of August. So that certainty that you have that Assad crossed the red line, 
is feeding into the government, the media also feeds into that. That's a real worry. Where is the uncertainty that helps us understand a more complex world? Well, if, I, if I've made an error on that, and that's the only source I've heard on it, I've heard David Kilcullen assert the opposite and I've got some confidence in him. And I've, if it's become a conventional wisdom and it's wrong, I take that on board. It doesn't change the fundamentals about the fact that Assad leads a pretty unpopular repressive regime that is propped up by Iran and that there is a range, there's a large number of Sunni armed groups now determined that he'll go. The Turkish feel the same way about that. And so, put the question back to you, is the Middle East, would the Middle East have been a better place had Assad gone when Obama suggested he might have gone or would it, is it better that he stayed? I'm just wondering when, uh, when the tipping point comes in the spread of the caliphate, is there a time when uh, it'll get to a point where Israel will decide to go alone militarily? Look, I, if you want some uncertainty, I'll give it to you. I don't know the answer to that. Um, but I, I would think Israel's more likely to stay on the sideline than Iran, frankly, if that looks like... You know, the, the Iranians are deeply engaged in Iraq now. Um, and this is, the, this is the wicked nature of the problem. Assad is, is their person. And if you wanted to be really pessimistic, you know, we're almost operating as the Iranian Air Force flying airstrikes while their militias retake certain Iraqi cities. And the, the nation that has <clears throat> had the aspirations to join NATO and is most closely aligned militarily with us has been on the sidelines because Assad stayed on, namely Turkey. The tipping point, I think, look, there, there's been some erosion of their control of territory. Um, the fall of Ramadi was a blow and no one should soften that, pretend that wasn't a significant reverse. But in the last few days, um, the Kurdish... Uh, the, the Kurdish militia have captured um, Talabiyad, which stands astride the communication line between Raqqa, the, cap uh, the ISIL capital, and Turkey, and it does interdict the flow of foreign fighters, and that's significant because most of them have been using that as a means of access to get to the front. Uh, that'll affect the flow of foreign fighters, and they're very reliant on foreign fighters. So. Uh, I would like to think they've peaked, but I don't say that with any great conviction. And I would think, I can't see Israel entering this. I think Israel's, Israel's horror is the fact that they think Obama has paid too much for the nuclear deal with the Iranians. They think he ran dead on Assad to keep the dialogue with Iran going and has paid too high a price for that, basically. And I think that's their worst case scenario. And I think a full on you know, use of Iranian military force to defeat the caliphate's kind of the more likely scenario if it really went beyond a tipping point. We've gone beyond the tipping point of our uh, allotted hour. Um, it's gone so fast. I'm not quite sure how I feel. Um, you know, I feel kind of still pretty mortified about the state of the world, but I feel much better knowing that there are people as intelligent as you and others uh, in our defence force. Um, and it's been a great pleasure to have you here at the Fifth Estate, Catherine McGregor. Thank you so, so very much. <laughs>